for Nikola Jokic and a very good night for Denver Nuggets NBA champions for the first time in their history they took care of business against Miami Heat and it, uh, as we heard there marks the rubber stamping of a superstar in the game the Serbian Nikola Jokic uh, just uh, worth mentioning by the way tragic if familiar postscript to the game in Denver I guess a symptom of American life so just over three hours after the game there was a mass shooting uh, outside the stadium where there were nine people injured three of them are in critical uh, condition so that uh, has somewhat spoiled the party I think it's fair to say that being the 291st mass shooting in America this year mass shooting being defined as four or more people injured or killed so uh, both ends of the spectrum in Denver last night but uh, first NBA championship uh, for their franchise in 47 years in the league John Gonzalez uh, friend of the show is with us host of the Starting Five podcast John good evening Joe good to see you so I think we'll um, get on to Nikola Jokic in a moment, but just on the Denver Nuggets, first of all, I've seen their uh, win here described as like an exercise in patience over the last couple of years. They have played the draft. They have very much stuck with their coach. Michael Malone has been in the job since 2015, and they've uh, patiently, strategically brought this team uh, together. And so it's impressive in that respect. How good a team are they? They're the world champs, right? I mean, it took them 47 years to become NBA champions, so this has been a long time coming. But I think that uh, your framing of the situation is absolutely right, right? This is perseverance. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that Yusuf Nurkic was on this team and that there was some debate, a little bit, maybe not too much, about which player that they should really go with at center because they had that redundancy with him and Nikola Jokic. Now, obviously, Jokic is considerably more talented than Yusuf Nurkic, but he wasn't this talented. He wasn't two-time MVP, could have been three-time MVP, now finals MVP Nurkic. It took some time for him to, to warm up to that. But over these last few years, we've really seen him assert himself. And then uh, as a result, the team really rise along with him. And, and also getting Jamal Murray back was a big deal. I mean, when he was out, that was a big hole in their lineup. So having those two guys healthy together, that continuity goes a long way. Uh, Jokic is 28 years of age. He has become the first player in history to lead the league in points with 600 rebounds, 269, and also assists with 190. I have no great sense of how impressive those numbers are, I must say, but uh, he leads uh, on, with those uh, numbers in a single postseason. Uh, he's 28 years of age. Uh, is it only now he's been talked about as like best player in the league and, and potentially going to be talked about as one of the all-time greats in his position. He's a big man, we should say. That's say uh, he's, yeah. he's hanging out at center. Yeah, I mean, I think that there was a little some skepticism prior to this, right? That there were people, you heard his critics say that uh, you, you rattled off those numbers. The numbers have always been impressive, especially the counting stats. And for a big man, he's one of the great passing big men of all time. That was never in denial. But there were detractors who said he didn't play defense, that his team didn't win, that they didn't get to the finals. Now all of those criticisms fall by the wayside, right? I mean, any any knock that you might have had against Nikola Jokic, whether it was his conditioning or, again, his defense or the team achievements, he's done all of that. And he just put in, Joe, one of the great postseasons of all time. I mean, it was triple-double after triple-double. As you mentioned in the finals, he led all players in points, rebounds, and assists. And now he's a world champion. So I think he has to be mentioned as one of the best players in the NBA and uh, anybody who, who might uh, doubt that, I think uh, they're going to be few and far between now. And like, is it right to say if Denver were to win another one or two of these championships and he was to have a similar uh, hit a, a similar performance level, is he like in the conversation with uh Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Russell and, and Shaq and these kind of legends in, in that position or is that overstating things here? You know, I saw that conversation sort of pop up on social media today where people were saying, well, where is he going to rank? Is he going to be a top five center? And certainly those guys that you just mentioned are in that mix with Wilt and Bill Russell and uh, Hakeem, uh, Shaq, I'm, I'm probably not, Kareem. I think for me, 
I just look at it and go, he's one of the great players of his era right now. He'll certainly be a Hall of Famer. He won a championship. Um, you know, all the accolades that he's racking up, it's one of those things where in the moment it's easier just to enjoy it. And then, you know, with the benefit of hindsight one day, maybe we could slot him into that uh, into that hierarchy. But he's in the conversation, and I think that's all that matters. Right? Kobe Bryant used to say all the time when people would ask him, oh, you know, where do you fall in the all-time greats? Where are you compared to LeBron or where are you compared to Jordan? He said, I'm in the conversation, and I think that Jokic would be pretty pleased with that. I've also seen Denver described as, you know, pretty good but let's not get ahead of ourselves they're not going to be remembered as this all-time great side yeah i mean that's a knock that's been a knock against them right where you you go okay well they've got Jokic and they've got jamal murray and you know michael porter jr had sort of a an up and down postseason uh aaron gordon's fine the bench is fine but i think they are uniquely positioned to maybe change that narrative a little bit moving forward because this team, that continuity that you mentioned when we first started talking, it's going to continue, right? I mean, Jokic isn't going anywhere. Murray's not going anywhere. Michael Porter Jr. is not going anywhere. Michael Mullen's going to remain as the head coach. This team could be set up to win more than one championship, at which point that narrative about them not being an all-time great team, that would fall by the wayside too. Mm. Pretty interesting situation whereby we have a Serbian, um, if we accept that Djokic is now regarded as the best player in the league currently, Serbian's the best player in the league. You could say he's replaced a Greek-born player as the best player in the league, potentially. I mean, feel free to disagree with these characterizations. And the most sought-after player in the draft is uh, Wen Banyama, the Frenchman. Yeah. So. Would there ever have been a time where maybe the three best players or the three most uh, high, pro- not high profile is wrong, given other names, but uh, uh, high, highly regarded players both at both ends of the spectrum, um, Jokic in his peak and when Banyama coming through is the hot young thing. I don't think uh, European basketball would ever have had a hold on the NBA like that. Yeah, and you could throw Luca in there too, right? I mean, for sure, no matter where you slot these guys, you know, Wembenyama as as the exception, but everybody is really excited about him. Wherever you slot those guys, they're in that same conversation that we were just talking about, about the best players in the league. And that's a testament to international basketball, right? And the, the way that the league has really grown over the years, because it had been for a very, very long time, up through, say, the mid-90s, late-90s, this really parochial, provincial thing right where it was american dominance and you had some players who would come in from from vladi divak or Peja stoyakovic who certainly were excellent players but were sort of the exception to the rule and now it really is an international game and we've seen that also manifest itself you know at the olympics or uh, at the world championships where um all kinds of different international teams are giving the Americans run for their money. And, and certainly Jokic had just turned in one of the great seasons that we've seen. Giannis is maybe the most dominant player in the NBA and, and Luca can do all sorts of things. So I, I think it's a real testament to international basketball. Yeah. I wonder, I would presume as well that scouting networks are far more sophisticated. Yeah, they have to be, right? I mean, when I was with The Ringer, I wrote a story about uh, an American scout who's basically been living abroad since before the pandemic. He had been in China. The pandemic happened. Then all of a sudden he relocated to Greece and now he's in Serbia. And that was, he was explaining to me, sort of rare for Americans to be positioned in that spot. And and it's not just Americans doing it. It's the International Scouting Network where they're tapping into foreign scouts who are native to those countries. So um, you can find good, talented basketball players all over the globe. And how, because like, there's a degree of hyperbole with the next big thing always. Sure. So how exceptional does one Banyama look or, or do you think people are going overboard here? I don't. I mean, I have seen him play a couple of times. That's different than being intimately familiar with his game. But that skill set, Joe, paired with his size. I mean, he. I, I know that a lot of people sort of worry about his weight, but I would say, well, when a guy like KD came in, KD was hyper thin. And they have a similar body size. Wembenyama is obviously taller. What height is he? He's you know, seven, it depends on what listing you're using here, but a lot of people plot him in that seven, four range. So he's taller than Kevin Durant by several inches. He's taller. There was a really 
fantastic picture, Joe, of him standing next to Rudy Gobert and making Rudy look small. So when you pair that kind of height with yeah. his defensive ability and then the handle, the ability to shoot, there's a reason why people are so excited to see him. I think he's going to be amazing. Okay, still only 19. So yeah. he'll be in the NBA next season. He'll be in the NBA next season. It's going to be, it's going to be something to say. So I'd be curious to get your sense of where the league is then in terms of the big players. If we just take, say, this century and you have the Lakers in the early part of the century and Phil Jackson doing his thing and then San Antonio Spurs and Greg Popovich Mm -hmm. went blow for blow for a period and then the Lakers came back and had a nice little spell again under Jackson and then we're into the Golden State Warriors era which is what 2015 through to 2022 with the exception of two years along the way but an era of incredible dominance and now we have Denver Nuggets 2023 what uh, how does the rest of this decade look I'm really enjoying the parody I mean you just mentioned those chunks of teams that were sort of dominant in their era and it sort of took maybe not like the entertainment out of it, but certainly some of the intrigue, especially with the Warriors. That chunk where the Warriors added Kevin Durant after winning titles took some of the, it was almost inevitable. It was inevitable that we knew where the season was going to end up. You had LeBron James in the East when he went back to Cleveland and you figured his teams were going to get through. And then eventually it was going to be the Warriors. Yes, the, the Cavs won one of those uh, championships, but it sapped a lot of um the intrigue for me and that's part of the fun of sports not knowing in the, in the same way that you know everybody kind of expected man city to be dominant this season and they were and then even when arsenal was top of the table you kind of knew that they were going to come back that kills it for me now with denver nuggets you know last season we had the golden state warriors just popping up out of nowhere the year before that we had Giannis winning his first title with the bucks you know, odds on favorites for next season, probably the Nuggets. But again, it's going to be this grab bag of you could see a whole bunch of different teams ending up as the NBA champions. And I think that really enjo- uh, adds to the entertainment factor, the enjoyment factor and just the interest in the league. And are the Golden State Warriors done, John? You know, Joe, every time I think they're done, they keep coming back. So I'm uh, loath to write them off, especially when they have Steph Curry. But you just saw their GM, Bob Myers, deciding that he's done with the organization. He was the architect of that franchise. So I'll be really interested to see. They've got some big decisions to make over the offseason with what's going to happen with Draymond Green. Clay Thompson's going to want a new contract. They're going to need to add some new pieces. So a lot of moving parts there for them. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's uh, well, I was going to say it's funny. It's not quite the right word. But um, I mentioned the uh, shooting in Denver and, and generally after particularly bad uh, shootings in American life I fully wait for the Steve Kerr video to go viral who speaks so brilliantly what about his hunger to keep going with the State Warriors where's he in his career yeah you know every time I come on I I think like this will be the time where we just get to talk about basketball but invariably something happens in America where you and I end up talking about the unfortunate components of life here and that's You're right. You know, Steve is one of those guys when these things do happen, when there is a mass shooting or there's something happening in our political system that's untoward, that he'll step forward and speak up. Greg Popovich is another person. Mm So I don't I'm not sure about his hunger. I mean, it doesn't look like he's going anywhere anytime soon. But my ultimate point here is that I hope he doesn't go anywhere anytime soon, Joe, because. We need people like him in sports with a platform to speak up and speak out when so so many other people just are reluctant to do so. Uh, Dominance tends to breed a certain contempt, uh, as every bit as much as familiarity. So uh, the Golden State Warriors, that team, or say the Lakers in the previous decade, were they the teams that everybody loved to hate or was there a degree of well everybody loves a winner I'm going to support the Lakers or I'm going to support Golden State even though I might live thousands of miles away what was the general um, feeling from basketball fans towards say the likes of the Lakers or the likes of Golden State Warriors in their pomp yeah I think the Lakers are an interesting and sort of unique case because Uh, They're a legacy team. They've been around forever. So in the same way that the Celtics are, they've got sort of a national fan base. The Warriors were a different case. They popped up out of nowhere. They hadn't been historically good. Steph Curry is a really easy guy to root for. And at the time when he was enjoying his meteoric rise, we were seeing a player of his size dominate the league in the way that we hadn't before. So I think 
there was a, a component there that was really fun for people mm. for a time. But then when they're winning year after year after year, that sort of saps some of the enjoyment. So I think uh, it went back to people who are Warriors fans in the Bay Area being Warriors fans and the rest of the country being ready to move on from that. Okay. So I, what I'm hearing there is as you're watching the sports bar, there was a degree of there's Steph Curry with another three pointer. The fatigue, right? Yeah. yeah. The novelty. Initially, there was a novelty that was really yeah. exciting. Yeah, changed the I game. was one of those. Yeah, I was one of those people. I loved watching and couldn't, couldn't get enough. But after a while, if you're, it's the same, if you're eating the same meal over and over and over again for years, eventually you're going to want some variety. Mm. So it sounds like you feel the league is in a good place and, and this uh, newfound parity is just what it needs after the last decade. Yeah, for me, uh, especially, uh, you know, I watch a lot of basketball. And when you start a season almost, you know, 100 percent convinced that Team A or Team B will end up in the finals, that ruins a little bit of it. Mm. Uh, Whereas if you start the season and you go, okay, well, the Nuggets are the defending champions. But last year, the Warriors were and the year before that. It was the Bucks. And none of those teams repeated. And there's so many other talented teams in the mix. I'm interested to see what will happen in Phoenix, for example, with KD being there for a full year. And now who knows what's going to happen with Chris Paul and will he be back or not? And the the Celtics were fantastic all season until they ran into a really hot. The Heat are the perfect example of this, Joe. They were the eighth seed. Nobody picked them to be in the finals. They did it with Jimmy Butler and the most undrafted players in the entire NBA. I mean, I'll take that all year long where all of a sudden a team comes out of nowhere Mm. and surprises people and goes on this fantastic run and really gives us a lot of entertainment. So, yeah, I think the league's in a great, great spot. And I wonder, you know, you watch so much basketball as a final thought. The way Steph Curry did it, the way the uh, Golden State Warriors did it was uh, new. We hadn't seen Mm three-pointers taken to that level. Uh, Is there any early sense of what the great innovation uh, is currently or might be in the coming years or are we still waiting to see? I mean, we're never going back, right? I mean, now that math, the math has won. Everybody knows that three is worth more than two. It's very simple here. So it's going to be three-pointers and then getting into the lane for dunks and layups. And if not that, then foul shots because they're uncontested. Mm. And that mid-range game, there are certain practitioners of it. I mentioned KD earlier, Chris Paul, another one, who are good at it. But they're still going to be the exception. And the rule going forward is exactly what we've seen. You're going to be hoisting and trying to get to the line. And one last one for me, because in, in our uh, national sport here, Gaelic Games, people bemoan um, fielding, as in balls booted out to the middle of the pitch and everybody jump up and somebody rises highest and catches the ball and it's very dramatic. And it's, it's, it's died because they're so sophisticated now and they, they play it short and keep possession. Possession is king. Is there any outcry in basketball? We're sick of these three-pointers. I want to see dunks. I want to see action around the net. Let's, let's uh, b- manipulate the rules of touch. Has that conversation started or no? Yeah, there has been. I mean, I, I think the NBA is is pretty progressive in in admitting where the game is going and that they do have kind of a statistical problem here in terms of style of play because everybody's playing the same. Uh, you have legends of the game like Barkley and Shaq and guys like that who are really outspoken. Uh, but there have been conversations about do, does there need to be, you know, maybe a four point shot or is there ways to widen the court and get more spacing and allow for those sorts of things. So I think the game will continue to evolve. But for right now, we're still headed in the same direction. OK, very good. Well, 